Hello, this is Tommy, and welcome to another AI and Games article. So this is the first in a series um, where I wanted to focus on how artificial intelligence has been explored as a mechanism for game design. Now, this idea has only really kicked off in earnest since around the mid-2000s, and there's been a lot of interest in this area, and we're seeing quite a few advancements in what's well, been a relatively short period of time. So for the first video, I wanted to talk specifically about the Mario AI competition, which ran between 2009 and 2012. Now, as you may know, AI competitions are built to provide an established benchmark, and these provide some interesting and potentially unique problems for researchers to tackle, and they're designed because it's a problem that we haven't tried solving yet, and typically we manage to make it interesting enough to kind of rally people behind it. So, you know, why Mario? Well, Mario differed from another popular AI competition that had already been established, Ms. Pac-Man. Of course, the main reason for that is that Mario traditionally is a 2D platformer, and also the fact that Mario is more or less ingrained within popular culture, and the idea of what a Mario game is, is by now, you know, rather well established. Now, in this video, and in the accompanying article, we focus on two key tracks that were in the competition. The first track, um, which is the gameplay track, and that was where the challenge was to actually create a piece of AI software, an AI bot, that could replace you as the human player. So it essentially takes over and plays as Mario. However, we're far more interested in what was called the level generation track, and that's where the challenge is to build a system that can make fun and interesting levels, essentially creating Mario levels um, using procedural generation algorithms. So, to start, Let's take a refresher on what traditional 2D Mario as a game looks like, what it actually entails. And this will help us understand not only the relevance of the competition, but the challenges faced in both of these tracks. Okay, so by now I trust everyone, and by everyone I mean about 99% of you who watch this video understand what Super Mario Brothers is. If not, SHAME ON YOU! One of the key things to appreciate is that while Mario has been around for over 30 years, what we consider Mario gameplay has evolved significantly over time. Sure, people often complain that Nintendo making another Mario game, but in actual fact, things have changed a lot. So if we have a look at what we've got here, this is the original Super Mario Bros., released in 1985, and it's the first game that defines what we consider typical Mario gameplay. Mario is moving from the left over to the right, he's hitting all the boxes to try and find coins or power-ups, and he's either jumping on or avoiding enemies. In the original game, it's the first time that Nintendo experimented with platforming mechanic um, while continually moving to the right. Whereas in the preceding game, in the original Mario Brothers, um, it was actually all constrained within the one screen. So of course, the goal being to reach the end of the level within the time limit, and I didn't do a particularly good job of it there. But of course, vert verticality is becoming rather important, given that we can occasionally find alternate paths, and in fact I decide not to take one, but I take a different path here, by actually jumping up and smashing through some of the platforms. In addition, we also get to see the use of pipes, either as obstacles, or as platforms itself, and of course there is that way to find hidden locations every now and then by going down through them. Okay, so let's move towards the next real sequel to this formula, and that was Super Mario Bros. 3, which was released in 1991. Now, Mario 3 sort of expands on the original idea of both verticality and non-linear design, which we can see here. Um, we've figured out a little bit more about when to jump and how to exploit it. There are more routes to go through some of the track, um, and it was really keen to emphasise running given that, as we saw, the Super Leaf, which I can then use to fly. Um, this is then reinforced in Super Mario World, shown here, which was released in 1992. Um, the notion of long stretches are sort of kind of reinforced to build up running, and flying's encouraged a lot more. The only real change to the mechanics come in the spin jump, which we saw a minute ago, but also the introduction of Yoshi. Hello! So, within less than 10 years, the concept of what Mario is, and how you play it, it's still largely the same. But we can see that the level design is beginning to evolve over time. An awful lot of things are still there, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to getting to that end point as fast as we possibly can. Now, this 
is nurturing an understanding among players. And, you know, understanding breeds familiarity and nostalgia to the point that Nintendo has actually made this part of their current product line. What we can see here is one of the entries from the new Super Mario Bros. series. Specifically, this is the release on the Wii U from 2012. While this series is largely influenced by the Mario games of old, it also continues to make changes to the formula, with a more modern emphasis on moving platforms and coin collection. Meanwhile, the level design is more or less the same. The characteristics that define a Mario game are now cemented in our minds, and they exploit that. Nintendo exploit this quite happily because, well, it means that you put your money down and you're going to buy the game. Now, the interesting thing is that while we have got this indication in our own mind of what we think a Mario game is, we still couldn't say for certain what a Mario game actually entails. Level design is continuing to change. Um, and the interesting part there is that there is no solid blueprint. However, while we cannot say with 100% certainty what is typical of a Mario game, given that Nintendo continues to redefine this idea, we do have a strong understanding of what's actually needed to play the game. So, with that in mind, let's go and have a look at the Mario AI gameplay track. So, if we cast our minds back to 2009, the first Mario AI competition was held by Sergei Karakovsky and Julian Togelius. The challenge was to create an AI bot that could play a clone of Super Mario Bros. called Infinite Mario. Infinite Mario, funnily enough, is actually developed by Marcus Person. You might have heard of that guy at some point in time. He's more well known for making a little game called Minecraft. While a range of AI submissions were received, the best was developed by Robin Baumgarten, which is what we're showing here. What was surprising about Robin's submission was that it relies solely on A-star search. For those of you not familiar with the method, it's an effective yet rather simple informed search algorithm. This A-star bot proved more effective than many of the other approaches, uh, such as evolutionary learning, given that it was told simply to travel forward without getting itself hurt. I realise that I'm sort of simplifying it a little too much, it's actually more complicated than that, but that's what we can really distill it down to. It would then use this to find the optimal path to move forward that didn't result in its own death. Mario in this case is pr was provided with a grid that could detect what was immediately behind him as well as a short distance in front of him. The red line that we're seeing in each frame is what the A-star would propose as the best path to take. Now, there are a wealth of other submissions that were received. However, there's a significant difference in performance when an AI attempts to learn how to play Mario versus using the likes of A-Star. This is because with A-Star, we use a heuristic that tells us how to evaluate the game world, whereas a learning bot has to figure this out on its own. Though, of course, this does not detract from Robin's submission, and as you can see, it's pretty spectacular. Now, let's look at the level generation track which ran twice in 2010 and 2012. The challenge here is to create an algorithm that can create a platforming level. In this case, yes, it's a Mario level, but bear in mind the goal is not to actually create a level that is considered a Mario level. Given, as we mentioned earlier, while we've got a good idea of what this might look like, there's no concrete definition for it. As such, the judges of the competition were asked to rank the submitted maps based upon their experience with that map and kind of what was their preferences. The methods taken for these entries vary. Um, some were focused on creating environments that were reliant upon rule systems that built maps, then tweaked them to have special areas of interest. Other systems were reliant upon human interaction by using the player to evaluate a test level and then used that uh, feedback and metrics that it accrued from that to build its own procedurally generated levels. The videos that we show here is work by Ben Weber, and this was his Pro MP generator. This takes multiple passes at the level to add features gradually, first with the main terrain, then adding the hills for non-linear play, pipes, enemies, blocks, and lastly, coins. As we can see from the video, while these levels do not look exactly like those that we've seen before, they do evoke certain design elements we have seen previously. Perhaps more importantly, they're playable and it offers a unique challenge from what we've seen in previous footage. Now, what made Ben's submission interesting is that it's parameterized, meaning that this can be customized based upon the skill level of the player. In this footage, uh, we now see Baumgarten's A star player attempt to tackle the Pro MP generator at its most extreme setting. Um, this would certainly cause a player more than a few problems as well. Also, given that the PCG system does not entirely constrain itself the same way a human designer would, um, 
we see not only some particular bottlenecks that perhaps a designer would never actually enforce, but also bizarre characters, um, such as a walking or flying piranha plant, as well as bullet bills with wings. It's all pretty extreme, and I don't think I'd last more than five seconds playing this myself. So this is but a snippet of the work that was done in this area, and I encourage anybody who's interested not only to, you know, please read the article on my site, because I put a lot of time into it, and I'd really appreciate you coming by for five minutes, but perhaps more importantly, consult the wealth of material, um, the research publications that were put together not only by the organisers, but by the contributors on this subject. Fortunately, while the Mario AI competition has since ended, the work continues on in the platformer AI competition where the focus is not only, once again, on the level generation track, but also a Turing track, um, where an AI bot attempts to fool judges into thinking it's human, based on its gameplay style. So, that's it for this video. Thanks very much for watching. Hope you found this interesting, and please keep an eye out for my other AI and games videos. Bye! You've just survived another AI and games video. Congratulations! You should now revel in your success by watching another one. Go on, I know you want to. These YouTube videos accompany the articles held on my website, where we highlight interesting applications of artificial intelligence in games, both in commercial products as well as research projects. So if you want to know why AI researchers are so interested in the likes of Ms. Pac-Man and Super Mario, or how the AI in the Fear and Batman Arkham trilogies work, and please check out my AI and games section on my website t2thompson.com.